The one who comes in peace is always welcome. The one who comes to teach is always welcome. The one who comes to learn is especially always welcome. Positive energy and creation energy to all of you. Uh, I would like to welcome you to another organic African paradigm lecture. 360 dimension of soul, intelligence, and science. Organic African understanding for African people globally. Um, previously, I did uh, tell you guys that I would be doing a lecture, a very unique lecture. Today, um, this lecture is very unique in the sense that this lecture is specifically focused on uh, 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 an element of non-African people. There's, so the lens we are going to be looking through today would be looking through the African lens, looking at a, no, a group of non-Africans. So typically in the organic African paradigm, what I try to do is I try to focus the lens on the African people. Everything I try to do through these uh, 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 eyes is always looking at the world through the African eyes. Today we are going to be looking at a group called an area of our planet called the Sinosphere. Um, that's what this lecture is going to be about today. There is a area on planet Earth called the Sinosphere. Um, this is what we are going to be focused on. So let me uh, put this lecture in, let me share this lecture in the Organic African Paradigm Facebook group so that way I can begin here shortly okay okay I've shared it to the Organic African Paradigm Facebook group so now we might be we can begin our title the title of today's lecture is 360 dimension of understanding Sinocentrism versus Afrocentrism right Sinocentrism versus Af Afrocentrism. So the goal is to expand the vision or the lens of the African people is to expand our comprehension of this world we live on, this planet we live on, especially since um, our interaction with the environment, our interaction with other groups on this planet is vital. Um, we need to understand everybody on this planet and we need to understand them in a 360 dimension not just uh, a limited sphere on, of understanding we need to fully understand every group on this planet so that's what this lecture is going to be about uh, in the organic African paradigm there is we often say know thyself know thy enemy know thy environment and that's typically what all the topics in the organic African paradigm are center around. Know thyself, know thy environment, know thy enemy. And your enemies live in the same environment as you. You need to know your environment and your enemies because these are things, these are things and forces that are always changing. And you as an African, if you don't learn to change, while the, when these forces are changing, what that does for you is that puts you in a very awkward position. And it can lead to your, uh, well, oppression. You can be oppressed because you are unprepared, you are ill-equipped to function in the world that you, you're supposed to function in. And oftentimes, the people that get oppressed in this world are the people who are ill-equipped to defend themselves, are the people who are ill-equipped to manufacture the tools that they need to protect and defend themselves. That's often the case for this planet Earth. Um, if you lack the tools, if you lack the intelligence, if you lack the, the, the in-depth understanding of your environment, if you lack the in-depth understanding of your uh, enemies and yourself, it can become a hazardous way of living. And if you are of one of those people who are going to produce children uh, one of those Africans who have children you're going to give uh, put children in the world and you expect your children to have a better future and you are careless about this uh, uh, making sure your children survive then that makes you an ignorant African it means you are ignorant 
it means that you are someone who is who is clueless you you just uh breed children and bring them into the world but you don't know what the other requirements are for like what you're supposed to do there you're not just supposed to have children i know it's easy to have children two people can just get together and nine months later or ten months later there is a child in the world but you can't just have children and not know about the world you live in and not know about the environment you live in because that is the the definition of ignorance and foolishness and i mean if you are that person you you will get oppressed by the more powerful people so that's why this lecture here is about today um the sinosphere um is asia um often you you hear me uh, use the word Eurasia. Often people hear me use the word Eurasia. I talk about Eurasia. Now, if you look at the map, the African continent map, right, the map of the African continent, you will see that Africa is, a, a, and, and it, as a continent, is connected to the Middle East. They are one continent. The Africa and parts of the Middle East are one continent. But when you go to Europe itself, Europe is connected to Asia. So those two land mass are called Eurasia when you combine them. Now, there are Western Eurasia is where Britain, uh, France, all these other people come from. Then you have Eastern Eurasia is where um, you have China and whatnot. Then you got the Southern uh, where you have India. And then you have the Northern is where you have Mongolia, Russia, etc. So that's how Asia works, okay? So if you're thinking about Asia, how does Asia work? Western Asia is Europe, is basically Belgium, Germany, all these people are Western Asians. And then if you go to Asia itself, China is Eastern, okay? Uh, and then Southern is India. Um, and then uh, northern is Man Mongolia, um, etc. So that's how Asia works, okay? Um, those of you who don't know, uh, Europe and... Um, oh, the one who comes in peace is always welcome, positive energy and creation energy to my guest, okay? Welcome all of you to this lecture. We will be learning a lot about China today, so I hope you guys are ready to learn about China, okay? So as I was saying... Uh, Northeastern is where Mongolia would be, and then uh, Russia would be uh, uh, northern Eurasia. You know, uh, typically there is the um, uh, the Black Sea and, and, and um, the and between the the Zagros Mountain. All these areas are all part of Eurasia. The the Caucasus Mountain is where you have uh, Siberia and uh, uh, um, all these different uh, um, areas okay so now uh, the topic today will focus particularly on China and the reason this topic is going to center on China is because um, recently I came across an article uh, about the Sierra Leone government uh, there is, uh, uh, in the article it says that the Sierra Leone government sold a huge part of uh, land to the Chinese in uh, uh, Sierra Leone, our entire forest. And so, um, you know, what the Chinese are going to do with that forest is clear. They're going to cut up the forest, uh, you know, they're going to extract the minerals out of the land and including the wood. They're going to destroy all the animal life in that environment. They're going to kill all the animals in that forest that inhabited that forest. They will destroy all the animals. They will uh, you know, do things with the land. They will perform some rituals on the land to cleanse the land of the African people's spirit. So if you have African people's ancestor, your if like your DNA, your ancestor DNA was in the land, the Chinese would uh, do rituals on that land where they will purify the land. They will destroy your ancestor spirit from the land. So, uh, you know, once they, they, they remove, they purge the land of your ancestor spirit as an African, now they can strip the land of the resource. So uh, African people as a, as a race, as a people globally, we exist in this world in a very uh, superficial way. We don't understand much about this planet. We don't know much about this world as Africans. We pride ourselves on having culture and this and that, but 
when the when it comes to intelligent living on this planet understanding this world that's where we are deficiency we have a deficit in understanding this planet at least we are not our ancestors our ancestors had a thorough understanding of this planet but this uh, uh, the the people that we are today the Africans that we are today we have a much much more limited understanding of the environment much limited understanding of our enemies much limited understanding of ourselves as Africans and that's where the organic African paradigm comes in the organic African paradigm plays the role of teaching you about yourself teaching you about your environment and teaching you about your enemies so that you as an African can become what you were meant to be your true self be comfortable in your skin be comfortable with your hair be comfortable with your skin color you don't need to bleach your skin you don't need to do none of those things you don't need to hate your skin color or 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 feel that you are inferior or undervalue yourself um, because you know about yourself you know about your environment and you know about your enemies so this is what the lecture is for so what the Chinese will do with that forest in the Sierra Leone they will destroy the forest but not just the forest they will kill the ancestor spirit of the African people in that forest so because Africans when we die when we die as Africans our our how you call it our atoms our atoms our genetic material we bury our dead in the soil when we bury our dead relatives in the soil we bury the animals that die in the soil the soil collect all your atoms and it recycles your atoms and it put them in the trees and the fruits and the vegetable and all those things that come back in the fruit when you consume the fruit and you you produce sperm when you produce sperm the sperm is a, a it goes to the egg and you reproduce yourself you recreate your ancestors in the physical world so this is a scientific understanding I'm giving you I'm not giving you some mumbo-jumbo thing I'm talking about your atoms when you bury your ancestors into the soil the atoms go back into the soil the atoms are recycled into the soil and they are buried and then they are reproduced in the trees and the food you eat and then that food becomes your sperm your sperm is discharged into the womb and that womb becomes a human life and then your your ancestor spirit can come back into that vessel and they can live in the world again so African people this is the relationship you have with the African continent but you don't understand this relationship because you see the environment as just a tool you see the environment as just a, a thing that you can use and you can do whatever you feel like you feel that you have no responsibility to the environment you have no responsibility to your ancestors you hold nothing you you owe nothing to the universe this is how African people think African people say we owe the universe nothing we owe our ancestors nothing we these people are are nothing to us the trees the forest the donkeys the birds the animals are nothing to us this is how African people think you know and we are going to have to break this cycle of ignorance and educate the African people into their organic African paradigm their 360 dimension of understanding so the question is the title of the lecture is 360 dimension of understanding the sinocentrism versus Afrocentrism so the question here now is what is sinocentrism what does those word sino mean sinocentrism what does sinocentrism mean so um if you look at the word uh, uh, uh centrism centrism usually has to do with uh it, it means like something to be preeminent 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 means uh surpassing all others very distinguishable in some way so uh, um uh preeminent means something that is superior something that is high quality and sino um the word sino is relating to china so it was a terminology that the chinese people created so um the when you say what is sinocentrism is basically an ideology that the chinese people have okay and that ideology is that china is the is the cultural political economical center of the planet earth 
this is what it means it means that china is the sinocentrism means china is the cultural political economical center of the entire planet earth china is the center of the world um this is what sinocentrism means so if you don't know what sinocentrism mean it means that the chinese people are superior they are the center of life on planet earth and life revolves around them on planet earth that's what the word sinocentrism mean okay now when did this word come about this word came about uh, you know uh, a while ago when the when they, the 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 chinese met the, the 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 portuguese and all these other people in the 16th century um they were kind of confused why europeans were when they drew the map of the world why they didn't put chinese china as the center of the map of the planet earth they were kind of confused they were like why are we not at the center of the world why is not the world revolving around us you know so this is where the the idea of these people come from and the word itself china the name china itself was not a name that the chinese people called themselves the chinese people uh didn't really call themselves chinese this is a is a name that was given to them by foreigners so the portuguese and uh other people the the people in malaysia and these other people from india etc they are the ones who started calling these people chinese these people don't call themselves chinese uh this this word chinese is a foreign word that was put on them and they just accepted you know this like okay we are chinese but what are they called if they are not called chinese they are called the han people the han so they are called han h a n the word is h a n so they are the han people so that's what they are called so the um origin the, the the han the people of han you can call it them the people of han or the han chinese right uh that's what they are called han chinese so the han chinese it's uh are what china has 55 ethnic groups so um you know most of us we live in different countries on the continent liberia for example i believe we have 16 ethnic groups in liberia right so china as what you know it china has 55 ethnic groups this is what you need to know about china china has 55 ethnic groups and the the largest ethnic group in china which is 90 uh, uh um 90 91 point five one percent 91 point five one percent is the han chinese the han chinese are the highest predominant group they are one uh, 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 um, 1225 million people 1225 million people are the han chinese but then they also have other groups in the uh, uh, uh in the mix right like the the manchu uh like the the shonu or the mongols um and all these other groups that are are, are part of it up or uh, the chinese now but the chinese themselves that's what they are they are 91.5 percent han chinese and we will go into their their story so we are going to uh really be going in depth today you're going to learn a lot about china you as an african if you didn't know anything about china you when you leave this lecture you will know as much as you need to know about china and you can go and you can research and learn more about them if you choose to um but i think uh, uh um you will learn pretty you'll learn a, a lot about them today in this lecture so now that we have to go with the timeline of the chinese people we have to go by their timeline when they when they started out as the chinese people when they became uh, uh uh when they settled this area in eurasia called china we need to uh when they started civilization over there so if you look at the geographical location of china the geographical location of china itself is 3.7 million square miles the geographical location of china is 3.7 million square miles compared to africa africa is 11 
11.3 million square miles. So Africa is 11.3 million square miles and China is 3.7 million square miles. So China is like a small continent or, or country compared to Africa. Africa is a massive landmass, the biggest landmass on, on, on Earth and after Eurasia. When, once you remove Eurasia, the entire Eurasia, Africa is the second largest landmass on planet Earth. So China has two major rivers. These rivers play a major part in the Chinese people's history. The Chinese people's story, there are only two rivers that are so, in, uh, these are very symbolic rivers in their entire story. So the two rivers are the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, the Yangtze River. So the Yangtze River is the largest and the Yellow River is after that. But the Yellow River is very, very, very symbolic because that's where the first generation of Chinese people are settled. They settled by the Yellow River and then they were able to start developing the Chinese civilization. So who were the first group of Chinese people? The first group of Chinese people were called the Shia. The Shia. So don't mind my pronunciation because I'm not Chinese. Uh, so my linguistic pronunciation is not going to be accurate 100%, but the, the information will be solid, but the, the pronunciation will be a little bit off. But the first uh, uh, group of Chinese, the ancestors of the Chinese are called the Shia. Now, the, the ancestors are called the Shia. That was the first group. So, um, the Shia itself, the Shia, uh, 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 um, after the Shia, there is the, the next uh, uh, dynasty of China would be the Shang dynasty. After the Shang dynasty, you would have the Zhou dynasty. After the Zhou dynasty, you would have the spring and autumn period. After uh, then you, you go into the warring states and then you go into the Qin dynasty, uh, 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 the Qin dynasty, you go into the Han dynasty, you're going to go into the Three Kingdom, you're going to go into the Jin dynasty, uh, you know, north and south, and then you're going to go into the Sui, the Tang, the Song, the Yuan, the Ming, and the Qin, uh, uh, the Qin dynasty again. So these are just sort of kind of uh, uh, um, introduction I'm making to you to about China, okay? So we have to go back into the origin of China, their calendar, who these people are, um, where they come from, uh, uh, um, who were their enemies, um, you know, all these type of stuff. So let me see here, let me see if I can find um, the, I believe the Chinese people settled um, um, the, 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 the Shia dynasty was the first settled in the China River, the Shia dynasty from uh, two, 2070 BCE to 1600 BCE. So the Shia dynasty settled by the Yellow River from 2070 BCE to 1600 uh, uh, um, BCE. So that's before the Common Era or how you guys call it before Christ, before Jesus Christ was born. So 2,070 years before Jesus Christ was born, that's when the Shia settled in by the Yellow River. So the first ancestor of the Chinese people was is called Yu Gong. Yu Gong, Yu Gong the Great. So Yu Gong the Great was the first hero of China. Um, he was sent to battle the flood, the flooding of the Yellow River. So, the, as I said, the Yellow River, uh, it plays a major part in the Chinese people's story. The Yellow River is essential to China. Is, is ext if you look at the map of China, the Yellow River is there. So, when the ancient Shia dynasty settled in uh, by the Yellow River, they had an ancestor called Yugong. Because there was flooding, that time there was heavy rain flood. There was heavy rain flood that was flooding the Yellow River. So because the Yellow River was being flooded, the Chinese, they, I believe they had magic. Um, I think they had magic at that time in history. From, from what I'm reading in these stories, what I'm learning in these stories, the, the thing with Chinese history is weird. I'm going to say this. 
is mixed with a lot of magical um, supernatural elements. The Chinese history is full of magical and supernatural elements and then it's full of, of, of tangible history as well. So there is a detailed history and then there is a lot of supernatural elements like dragons and, 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 and you know, all these type of magic, you know, th th this in their story. So we will, you guys will find out more as we go into it. So Yugong, when the Riello River was flooding, the people said they told Yugong to um, use the magic to fight the, the Yellow River. So Yugong spent a time battling the Yellow River, trying to defeat the Yellow River and he was using magic and all that and after that um, you know he became the hero of the nation he became the first hero uh, of China he was a young man sent to battle the floods of the Yellow River so now who is the second hero of the Chinese people so all Chinese people Yu Gong is their common their first ancestor the first hero of China all Chinese people the first hero of China is called Yu Gong the second hero of China and the most important person in all of Chinese story. The most important, important person in all of Chinese history is called the Yellow Emperor, Huang Di. The most important person in all of China's history is called Huang Di. You know, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Huang Di, uh, uh, um, who, uh, uh, yeah, Huang Di. It, it, it was the, is the Yellow Emperor or the Yellow Emperor Huang Di is the is a legendary figure of the same Xia Dynasty. So um, his story is also full of a lot of legends where he was battling, uh, you know, going to heaven, coming down, you know, magical battles against another group of people. There was a lot of things involved in. Uh, 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 this stuff here. So um, he was a mix between myth and legend. So the way his story is set up is a lot of myth and legend in this whole thing. Okay. So this um, the the Yellow Emperor was alive. They say he was alive during the time uh, uh, 2697 BCE before the Common Era. So 2697 years before Jesus was born. Uh, this yellow emperor was the emperor of china at that time he was known as the architect the creator of chinese culture he was the creator of chinese governance system he was the creator of chinese technology the early technology and you know he lived for a hundred plus years and you know before he died when he grew uh, um i guess he got enlightened um he he when he got enlightened he rode a golden dragon and ascended into the heavens. So he's still up to right now in 2021. Huang Di is still the national symbol of he's still the symbol of Chinese nationalism today. So Huang Di, a, the Yellow Emperor, is still the symbol of Chinese nationalism today. So the entire China, um, Huang Di is their common ancestor. So you know how Africans, when you you if you come from a tribe, you will all everybody will say, well, our common ancestor is this person. All Chinese trace their origin to Huang Di, the Yellow Emperor. So all the culture that Chinese people have was invented by Huang Di. He's the architect of Chinese culture. His wife invented stuff. He invented stuff, and he was the only Chinese emperor who, who married. I think maybe two or three wives, but he didn't marry more than that. So Wang Di is the, the symbol of Chinese people. He is a very, very powerful symbol of nationalism. He is, if you can trace your DNA to, to Huang Di, the, the yellow emperor, you, you are set, you know, but nobody can trace their DNA. So what they will do is, uh, if they, they will say, oh, this person is descended from the yellow emperor because of how he acts because of his greatness, because the way he's great, right? So that's who Huang Di is. Huang Di is extremely, extremely important to the Chinese people. So African people, you need to know this if you're going to be interacting with these people, right? Um, you need to know who this person is. So he's the father and he's still the father of all of China, Huang Di. 
Okay, now, when you're dealing with the Chinese people's history, when you're dealing with the Chinese people's history, you're going to learn, there's some strange stuff you're going to hear. You're going to, I mean, it's not strange, actually. It's, um, it's sort of like the way the Chinese people, uh, this Sinocentrism, because they consider themselves the center of planet Earth, that the planet Earth revolves around China, and everything, they are the most civilized people on Earth. So there are certain things in their culture that you are going to learn about when you go through their history. One of the key elements in their history that you're going to learn about is the mandate of heaven. So the mandate of heaven, <laughs> it's a very, it's, it's, it's the, how do you call it? it it's, it's exactly like the ancient Kemetic uh, 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 um, uh, mandate that the Pharaoh of, of Kemet had. So in, in, in ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet, the Pharaoh was called the son of the, the creator, the son of the universe, the son of Ammon or, or, or Re, right? So the, the Pharaoh was the son of the creator in, in ancient Egyptian. And the Pharaoh owned the land and the Pharaoh was expected to be fair to the people. The, the, the Pharaoh was expected to do the right thing. He was supposed to rule as the son of the, 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 the creator. And he was supposed to tell people the will of the creator. So the, the, the Pharaoh was both the leader of the priesthood and he was the leader of the land. Um, and, and, and so that's what the same mandate of heaven, the Chinese people have the same mandate of heaven. So the mandate of heaven says that the the emperor was the son of heaven and uh, the 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 rights were all the rights of the land were were his so that means that the emperor was given the mandate of heaven to rule the people and part of ruling was the emperor had to uh, do the right thing the emperor had to be morally upright the emperor had to be just the emperor had to be a good person so the mandate of heaven says the, the the creator or the heavens gave the emperor the authority to rule over planet earth and the emperor has to rule the people with benevolency the emperor has to rule the people with uh, righteousness morality the emperor has to do good you know the land if you couldn't plant your crops if the emperor said we are not going to plant nobody could plant if the emperor said we are not going to do this, nobody could do it. The emperor was a god. You, I hope you understand what I'm trying to tell you. The emperor was a god on earth, the living god on planet earth, the son of God. So um, the emperor was called the son of God. Okay? Um, son of heaven, that's the title. The official title was son of heaven. And what does son of heaven means? Son of heaven means that the emperor was the absolute ruler of all all things under heaven so meaning the emperor of china was the ruler of even the africans the europeans all of them were um, under the emperor of china son of heaven to be the son of heaven means all of the people on planet earth are under you including the africans they're all under you so if you went to china you had to prostrate to see the emperor you have to lay down on your face and prostrate to see the emperor you couldn't just go to china and see the emperor like that no it was you had to prostrate you had to put your faith worship the emperor like a god the son of heaven this is why you need to understand the chinese people where they come from as africans so africans the pharaohs this is our culture we started this culture the african people started this culture of the pharaoh being the son of heaven the african people said that the pharaoh was the son of heaven and the pharaoh was given the mandate of the creator that's how the african people came and what was that mandate of the creator the mandate of the creator was for the pharaoh to rule the people under the laws of ma'at under the laws of ma'at and ubuntu that's what and the, the Pharaoh used to rule under so in China this was the same concept and the reason that you see African uh, culture and Chinese culture has so much similarities is because now this is my suspicion this is my suspicion scientifically 
scientifically the Chinese in my understanding from okay from what I know scientifically the Chinese ancestors are the Khoisan people in South Africa scientifically biologically but the leader I believe that the leaders of the Chinese who come from the Dogon tribe I believe the aristocracy of the Chinese people the ancestor of the Chinese people come from the Dogon tribe of Mali so and the reason I was able to piece these uh, 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 two groups together and realize that man the Dogon were the aristocrats of early China the Dogon of Mali were the aristocrats of early China and the the, the Khoisan people were there so the Khoisan and the Dogon people used to be in early China before the 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 the, um, the Eurasians came out of the the Siberian mountain and they came and then they conquered and they started mixing their race. So they started breeding with the black people and then after centuries of bleed, breeding with the black people having mixed children, they all the black people die out and only the mixed people were left in China. They basically what I'm trying to tell you is one group of people left the continent and they went into the Eurasian steppes and they went into this Caucasus mountain so the Caucasus mountain would be where Russia is Siberia is when that group was in that mountain that group mixed with the Neanderthal some of them mixed with the Neanderthal and some of them did not some of them they, these Khoisan descendants um, they migrated towards where you have China and they saw black people and I believe these black people were the Khoisan uh, people, black Khoisan people, the ones that are in South Africa, and the Dogon people of Mali. I believe it was the Dogon people of Mali and the Khoisan people. Or maybe they were one people, they had the same magic, they had the same culture, the same system back then. So all the African people were one. But this is what I, I'm understanding from their story. They, they mix with these people until everybody in China became white and all the black people died you know all their bloodline was erased and all the Chinese became white so this is just my understanding from going through the Dogon history going through the Khoisan going through the Chinese is I'm able to put the, the pieces of the puzzles together and I'm able to see a bigger picture so let me continue on the, the lecture here um, so Chinese the Chinese people have the mandate of heaven the son of heaven and then they have also a forbidden city so the forbidden city was where the Emperor lived so the Emperor who ruled all under heaven who was the ruler of all under heaven lived in a city called the forbidden city or the Imperial where the Imperial Palace was the home of the emperors of China's and only the emperors in the royal family uh, lived in there and they had access to the forbidden cities right um and later on we will go more into that forbidden city um basically this is how their their culture is structured all the chinese people come from a common ancestor they have the common hero so it's not like africa where some people say my hero is nelson mandela some people say my hero hero is uh, uh jomo kenyatta some people say, it's not like africa in china the people have one hero the hero the ancestor the common ancestor is Yu Gong and then the the, the yellow emperor and then <clears throat> Huang Di and then it, it goes on like that so the Chinese people are a people who believe in ancestor above everything the most important thing in China is ancestry ancestry is not a joke in Chinese a story the Chinese people do not play with ancestors ancestors are very 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 important I cannot stress it with you guys so when you see them come to the continent and where you as an African they, they they're digging up the graves of your ancestors they are putting stuff to destroy your ancestral power you have to understand these people if you went to to China today and you try to temper with their ancestor you would not make it out alive they would straight up destroy you I mean they would destroy you as an if you were an African who were foolish enough to go and mess with their ancestors they would kill you no joke so 
That's the difference between the Chinese and the African right there. African people come, these people come and they can do stuff with your ancestor. They can pour stuff into the soil, bury pigs into the ground to kill your ancestor's spirit, to make the land unclean so your ancestors can leave the land. They can purge your ancestors of the land. But you, you can't go to China and do that. Ancestor is important. I cannot, the Chinese will never serve the ancestor of another group of people. They do not believe in that. They do not believe in serving the ancestor of other group of people. They put their ancestor above all other groups on planet Earth. So where you have the contrast with Africans, our ancestors, we reduce our ancestors. They don't do that. So let's continue the, the story here. I don't want to, there's much for you to read. So um, the, the, the mandate itself, the mandate of heaven itself was created by the Zhou dynasty, the Zhou dynasty. Uh, created a mandate of heaven and the the idea was that there could be only one legitimate ruler of China in, 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 at a time there could only be one ruler of China at a time right and the ruler had the blessing of the gods so the mandate of heaven was used to justify overthrowing the emperor so you couldn't overthrow the emperor that only there can only be one emperor in China there can only be one son of God or one son of heaven. In order for you to overthrow that son of heaven, let's say you wanted to overthrow the son of heaven, you had to have a justifiable reason in order for you to overthrow the emperor. You couldn't overthrow the emperor without having a justifiable reason. So the 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 Zhou dynasty, the Zhou dynasty, and the Zhou dynasty or the Zhou dynasty. They came up with the mandate of heaven. They said that the, the, the Shang emperor, the Shang lost the mandate of heaven. So how does the emperor lose the mandate of heaven? Well, the mandate of heaven has very particular rules. The mandate of heaven said you have to be morally upright. You have to take care of the people. You have to take care of the land. If there is famine, if there is flood, if there is war, if there is injustice, corruption happening in the empire, that means you can claim that the emperor has lost the mandate of heaven. So it will be a, 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 a chance for you to uprise against the emperor. So that's the only way you could rise up against the emperor. So if you wanted to start a military and you wanted people to join your military force, you would have to come up with an excuse for people to follow you. And people would not follow you unless you had the mandate of heaven. People in China would not follow you unless you had the mandate of heaven. If you didn't have the mandate of heaven, they would not join your rebellion. So, the Zhou dynasty, uh, the Shang dynasty, overthrew the Shia dynasty. So, let's let's do let's do the timeline, right? In 2070 BCE, the Shang dynasty overthrew the the Shia dynasty. The Shia dynasty was the first dynasty of China. When the Shang Dynasty overthrew the Shiite Dynasty, the Shang Dynasty was in power until the 1600 BCE. <coughs> they were in power until the 1600 BCE. Let me get some water, man, before I choke on this thing. Hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, the Shia dynasty. Um, remember, Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese people's story, right? Their story start in 2700 BC. 2700 BCE before the Common Era. 2700 years uh, before Jesus Christ was born. The Chinese people settled by the Yellow River, okay? And the first group of Chinese were called the Shia. After 
uh, uh, the Shia, you know, ruled the Chinese people for hundreds of years. The Yellow Emperor, all these other people came by and go and went. The the Shang Dynasty was the new dynasty that came. The Shang Dynasty overthrew the the the, the Shia Dynasty, and they became the uh, the rulers of China. After the Shang Dynasty ruled from uh, uh, um, uh, what? Um, let me let me uh, uh, pull up my timeline because I did create a timeline. I don't want to, uh, you know, do it without the timeline here. So hang on a second. Okay, so the Shang Dynasty ruled from 1600 uh, 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 BCE to 1046 BCE. So the the Shang Dynasty ruled the Chinese people from 1600 BCE uh, to 1046 BCE, and then they were overthrown by the Zhou dynasty and the Zhou dynasty overthrew them in 1046 BCE and the Zhou dynasty ruled China to uh, uh, 771 BCE so the Zhou dynasty in order for them to overthrow the emperor in order for them to overthrow the emperor they had to come up with an excuse to get the people to follow them they couldn't just come and say hey the emperor is the jerk. We need to rebel against him. You can't do that. You have to have a legitimate claim. The, the emperor is the son of heaven. So only way for the son of heaven to be overthrown was you had to lose the mandate of heaven. When you lose the mandate of heaven, then you can be overthrown. So the, 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 the Zhou dynasty now, they used this excuse and they overthrew the Shang dynasty, the emperor. And they became the, the ruling power. But the Zhou dynasty broke into two, two dynasties. So there was the Eastern Zhou and the Western Zhou. So this was the first time that China became divided into two groups, right? So the two groups are the, the Western Zhou and the Eastern Zhou. So the Zhou ruled from uh, 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 the Zhou uh, dynasty ruled from uh, um, 1046 BCE until 771 BCE and after the Zhou dynasty time was over who took over uh, 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 the Zhou dynasty uh, uh, after their time broke apart um, everything descended into chaos after the Zhou dynasty there is a period, this period is called the spring and autumn period of China. So, if you look at the Chinese people history, after the Zhou dynasty, then the Chinese people enter the, the spring and autumn period. So, the spring of and autumn period begin in 771 BCE and, and, and towards 476 BCE. So, this is called the spring and autumn period. So, if you go read uh, the Chinese history, they're going to tell you, say, Oh, the spring and autumn period. The spring and autumn period is a very beautiful word. It's, it's, it's called the spring and autumn period, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a part of Chinese history, the spring and autumn period. So it's a period in uh, Chinese history called the spring and autumn. So in spring and autumn, Confucius, Confucius wrote his magnum opus or his, 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 his philosophy. Confucius wrote his philosophy in this period and he named the philosophy the spring and autumn philosophy. So Confucius was the one who came up with the word spring and autumn philosophy. So the spring and autumn period is whenever you hear spring and autumn period in Chinese history, it means that was the age of Confucianism. And those of you who don't know what Confucianism is, we will get into that in a, in a short second. But the spring and autumn period. So remember, the Shia was the Shia overthrown by the Shang. The Shang was overthrown by the Zhou. The Zhou which said that they had the mandate of heaven and the emperor lost the mandate of heaven. So they overthrew him. And the Zhou broke into Eastern Zhou and Western Zhou. And then after that, they, they, you have the... Uh, uh, um, After the, the, the Zhou, you have the spring and autumn period. Okay? This is the age of Confucius. And during the age of Confucius, then you have the next state in Chinese history called the Warring States period. So the Warring States. So during this period, so after you have the, the Western and Eastern Zhou, 
the China fragmented into seven seven states. China fragmented into seven states called the Warring States. So this is how it happened. So from remember from 771 to 400 something you have spring and autumn period. This is the time of Confucius. And then during the time of Confucius, this the, the, the empire, China, fractured into seven warring states. Seven states that were fighting against each other called the warring states period. Okay, so this would be about uh, 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 400 BCE all the way down to 221 uh, uh, BCE. So from, 200, from 400 to 20, 221 BC, there were seven states in China that warred against each other. They fought against each other during this period called the Warring States. Okay, and who is Confucius? Um, Confucius, most of you uh, uh, have a, a um, kind of a, 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 a grasping of Confucius was a Chinese philosopher and a politician. And Confucius lived during this period of uh, where the warring state period, I believe, in the warring state period. So when he lived in the warring state period, Confucius created an ideology, a philosophy based on Chinese culture, which became the, it, the he in, he took all the ancient culture of the Chinese ancestors, all the Chinese culture. He combined it and created a philosophy for the Chinese people called Confucianism. So when he created this philosophy. His, he died because he took the philosophy to the emperors and they said, no, we don't want it. So he died and then it was 200 years after his death before his philosophy became the official philosophy of the Chinese people. So Confucius, he, he died. He, he wrote the philosophy and he went to people to give it to them and nobody took it. So he, when he, he, he died. He died from depression, not knowing that his philosophy would survive. And when he died, his students took the philosophy and they were, they were doing the philosophy in, the, in China during the age of the hundred schools of philosophy. So during this period, the Warring State period, China had something called the hundred schools of thought. So the hundred schools of thought was where all the different philosophies of China existed. And like Taoism, Taoism, uh, uh, Confucianism, uh, uh, legalism, Maoism, all these yin yangism, uh, 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 logisticism, all these different philosophies combined form the, the Chinese people used to call it the hundred schools of thought. Okay, meaning that every ruler could pick their philosophy. Every ruler that was ever elected to be the ruler of China would come and say, I'm going to use one philosophy from this school. So typically, they would take uh, some leader would take the, the logistics, some leader would take Maoist, some leader would take Taoist. You know, that's how it worked. So from the warring state period, China fractured into seven states. So this is where the story now of the Chinese people get more interesting. Now, Confucianism, Confucianism, for those of you, you have it, it's, a, it's a moral philosophy that was structured on the social culture of the Chinese. And it also has a hierarchical system in there. So Confucianism has a hierarchical system inside of it. Okay, um, in the hierarchical, hierarchical system of Confucianism, there's something called the superior gentleman. Um, the superior gentleman. So the superior gentleman is basically someone who is morally responsible. Uh, the moral responsibility of a leader. So if you're like a leader in the country, right? You have to have a certain moral responsibility to the people, to the family, to the collective. So this is why Africans, you don't understand the Chinese. You say, oh, the Chinese take care of their, 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 their people. The Chinese don't betray, they, they don't do those type of stuff, right? Because Confucianism tells you that you as a leader have to take care of your people. You have a moral responsibility. Even uh, uh, someone who's a, uh, called the superior gentleman. The superior gentleman always does the right thing for the people, lives in harmony. So it's again, this is all the mandate of heaven. So you take this mandate of heaven, you create a philosophy around this mandate of heaven and Chinese culture, the yellow emperor and all these things. And you have a philosophy that can really like make the people focus on the, the society, 
focus on the family focus on the responsibility of the people that's where confucianism comes in and uh, uh, um so now let, let let's go further into uh, um this uh, uh, period here okay so um confucianism was compiled from five uh, it was it was uh, it was written 551 bce um to 479 bce before the common era so that's when confucian philosophy was created 551 bce to 479 bce that's when it was created okay now the chinese have always taken philosophy very seriously i mean philosophy has been a vital part of their way of life you know that's why they had a hundred school of thought and that's why each of the philosophy had a governing and a living uh, system with them right now china was in this in the state of 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 fracture seven kingdoms or or the, or the warring states right um let me see if i can uh, uh uh find you guys the 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 list of all the states so that we can get it okay the, the the china fractured into during the warring state period right um china fractured into seven parts the seven parts were the zhou the han the wei the shou the yang and the and the qi i think so don't mind my pronunciation okay so the zhou z z h a o the Han, H-A-N, the Wei, uh, W-E-I, the Chu, C-H-U, the Yang, Y-A-N, and the Qi, or the Qi, um, Q-I. So those were the seven states that were fighting against each other for supremacy. So each of these states were trying to gain supremacy over the other state. So who, who got the supremacy? Who was the one that got the su supremacy? The supremacy was gotten by the Qing dynasty. The Qing dynasty was the one who got the supremacy. The Qing dynasty defeated all the other dynasties. They defeated the Han, they defeated the Wei, the Chu, the Yan, and the, and the Qi dynasty. They defeated all of them and they consolidated them into one country. And this was the first time that China had been unified. So the unifier of China, the Qing Dynasty, was uh, uh, the, the person who unified China. His name is Qin Shi Wang. Okay, Qin Shi Wang or Qin Shi Wang or Qin Shi Wang. I don't know. Uh, you know, forgive me. Is Qin Shi Wang. So the person who unified China in 221 BCE, his name is Qin Shi Wang or uh, yeah, Qin Shi Wang, Qin Shi Wang or Qin Shi Wang, one of those. But he was the one who unified China, and the story of how he even came to came to be born is very interesting, because it tells you about the story of Lu Bu Wei. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Lu Bu Wei was a businessman who went to his father and said, "Hey, I want to, um, you know, he wanted to invest in in in, in someone to become a prince." You know this prince was who was being held hostage in uh one of these uh, uh i think the Zhou. so the the prince uh this uh prince from chin this prince from chin dining the chin uh, uh, state right a prince from chin state was being held as a captive in another state and when uh uh, uh Lu Bue saw the prince he came up with the idea he was a merchant he came up with the idea and he said how can i make this guy into a a, a golden goose how can I make money off this guy? So he did some stuff. He worked his magic and and put the guy on the throne of the the chin. He he put the guy on the throne the throne of the chin, and the guy died. And the son that the guy had was Qin Shi Wan. Qin Shi Wan was the son that of the man that Lu Bue put on the throne. So Lu Bue is part of this story he's he's important to the chinese people he lu, lu Bui, uh, he has uh, uh, his own philosophy called the spring and autumn uh, 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 period to of of lu Bui, the spring and autumn of lu Bui, or something like that um so now after this emperor is born kishin wan is born right he, he, his name was yang su i think yang su or uh, i don't know how to pronounce their name uh, but his name was yang su after he unified Qin and, and the rest of the thing, he, he took himself the, the title of emperor. Emperor means Qin Shi Wang. Shi Wang, uh, 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 Huang Di, the, the, the title Di was 
the yellow emperor. So the yellow emperor was the one who had the title of Wang Di. He just, uh, and King Shi Wang took the title of Wang Di as the, the supreme ender, uh, emperor, emperor of all uh, under heaven. But King Shi Wang was a, a, a very severe ruler. The, the person who unified China, right? He, he unified China with violence. He unified China through war. So when he, he waged war against all the other states, and he defeated the Zhou, he defeated the Han, and all these other states, and then he, he consolidated them. So when he consolidated them, he decided that he needed a philosophy. A philosophy that was going to help him govern the state. So this is where the, he took a, a philosophy from the school of 100 philosophy, right? He took a philosophy from the school of 100 philosophy called legalism. So legalism was a philosophy in the school of 100 uh, thoughts at that time. So when he took legalism, what he did was he destroyed all the other school of thought. He destroyed majority of them. They burned their books. They destroyed all of them because he didn't want to have competing philosophies in a state. He didn't want people to have competing philosophies. So he destroyed all of those things, right? So the, 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 the legalism was created by, a, it was perfected by a, a scholar named Han Fei. Han Fei. So Han Fei was the, the the architect of legalism he was the one who perfected and what exactly is legalism legalism is pure 100 percent democracy not democracy bureaucracy so legalism is 100 percent pure bureaucracy so Legalism is hardcore bureaucracy. Basically, the law, no one was above the law. The law was above everyone. And everything was standardized. Everything became standardized and regulated, and including punishment. So how people could be punished, how people could be rewarded, self-interest, all those things were all accounted for in legalism. Legalism is a philosophy that, that has something called, it says all people are selfish. <coughs> Excuse me, man. Forgive me. So, legalism, it has a very strict philosophy, meaning that the law regulates all. It's a very brutal bureaucracy standard where everything is about punishment and reward. Everything is fixed. Everything is to the letter. Everything is very control, control. So, what King Shiwan did was he consolidated all the power onto one centralized power. So when he won the war, he consolidated all the system into one strong system. So he also unified all the other systems in China. So for example, right, in Africa, everybody has their own systems. On the African continent, everybody has their own system. The Yoruba people have their own system. The, 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 the Igbo have their own system. The Akan have their own system. The Airway has their own system. The, the Mendi has their own system. The Malinke has their own system. The, 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 the Bimbara has their own system, right? He took all these things and he consolidated into one system. This man who unified China, he took all their system and he unified it into one system. So meaning that it, it was it was trying he was trying to make the Chinese people into one people. So he organized the the, 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 the writing system. The writing system was part of the things that he standardized. He standardized the, the Chinese the writing system of the Chinese people is called Hanzi. Hanzi is that or uh, that stuff that you guys see, that calligraphy uh, writing system. Um, he created one standardized writing system. He created one standardized measuring system. He made all the roads in the same size. He used one currency, um, you know, and all those other stuff. But the thing about it is he was extremely, extremely brutal. Like, so he created a common purpose of empire building for the Chinese people. He, he started focusing on ga uh, gathering together talented people. So it was based on your talent. So he didn't discriminate on people's talent. He didn't discriminate on what you were. He gathered all kinds of people with different talents. No discrimination. He built a strong military. And he used the philosophy 
of legalism to centralize power and, and into a strict law and re, uh, uh, punishment reward law uh, you know that type of stuff so when he did this what happened was he was able to unify the chinese people all their systems into one system so philosophy play a vital role in chinese culture in in chinese culture philosophy is uh, is of the utmost important you know there is a a a, a military philosophy uh, diplomacy philosophy political logician moral laws all these different philosophies were all in the, the, the in China available for people to use so Chinese people um, they're part of their the essence of their culture is they always pick a state philosophy whenever they do this type of thing now come to part two of the unification so after Qin Shi Huang unified the Chinese people in 221 uh, 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 BCE, right? His methods were so brutal that the people started re re uprising against him. People rebelled against him because he was very, very severe. So people uprise against him. Now comes one, the, the second uh, 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 unifier of China. So, so far I've named the heroes of China, right? Here are the heroes of China, right? So you have uh, uh, Yu Gong. You have the Yellow Emperor Huang Di. You have um, now you have Qin Shi Huang, who is the the, the 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 unifier of China. Now comes the next person in the chapter of Chinese story. His name is Luo Bang, Luo Bang, or Liu Bang, Liu Bang. So Liu Bang is the next person in the story of the Chinese uh, uh, people. His name is Liu Bang. So Liu Bang now enters the page. So this is during the Qin Dynasty. So Liu Bang was this uh, guy, he was born, they said that when his mom was pregnant, for him, when his mother was pregnant with him, a dragon came out of the sky and, and she saw the dragon and he was hanging out with her. So a dragon came out of the sky and was hanging out with her. So, you know, the boy was supposed to be like a dragon. He was supposed to be a great person. But the boy was, he was kind of like a, 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 a rascal, you know, a, a, a delinquent. So... Liu Bang was a delinquent. He was a laid-back person. He was very, uh, you know, just a laid-back person. He didn't care. He doesn't like reading. He doesn't like learning. He doesn't like doing none of those things, right? But he managed to get a job as a sheriff in his town, in his hometown. So Liu Bang gets a job as a sheriff in his hometown. And when Liu Bang gets a job as a sheriff in his hometown, he now... He now, one day, uh, uh, his job was responsible for taking the prisoners out, all the prisoners, right? So one day he was going with the prisoners, and the prisoners, one of them, or a few of them escaped. So according to the law, or in the Qing dynasty, or the, in the, the, Qing di the Qing dynasty, if you let the prisoner, one prisoner escape, you will be put to death. So that was the law. So Liu Bang thought about it, he said, well, if I go and turn myself in, they will put me to death. So instead, he let all the prisoners go. So he, he let the prisoners go. So when he let the rest of the prisoners go, he, he ran away. And then the prisoners ran, they ran away with him. So when he ran away to another town or into the mountains or something, a dragon, the, a white dragon, a white serpent, you know, he, he killed the white serpent or something. And then an old lady came, and the old lady said, Oh, the red serpent has killed the white serpent. So what it was saying that he was going to overthrow the son of the, the emperor. That's what it was saying, the lady was saying. So this is the thing about Chinese history, right? You're going to find these type of things where they're saying dragons appear, giant serpents appear. One thing they're telling, one minute they're telling you actual story, then the next minute they tell you a dragon appear. And, you know, it, it's a little bit, you know, like that. So... A dragon, uh, you know, came, the red dragon was, was Liu Bang, and the white dragon was the emperor of Qin. So, now, Liu Bang became a rebel. And he had no choice but to fight against the empire, because now he was a fugitive, and he would have been killed. So, he, he became a rebel. So, when he became a rebel, him and another general, another guy, this guy is called, I think he's one of the four greatest warriors of China, uh, he teamed up with Liu Bang. So um, his name is 
Xiaolong, uh, Xiaolong or Xiaoyong, Xiaoyong or Xi Xiaoyong or something. Man, how these names are so difficult. Um, let me see if I can find it. Stand by. Give me a second. I think I, I have it somewhere here. Shang Yu or something like that. Let me see. Uh, Shang Yu, Shang Yu. I think it, it is Shang Yu, probably. Hmm. Shang Yu, Shang Yu. Anyway, it's probably Shang Yu. It's probably Shang Yu. So, um, Liu Bang now in his uh, uh, what you might call it in his rebellion, him and Shang Yu were supposed to go. Both were supposed to go for the Han. They were going to attack the Han Dynasty. So the the Qin Dynasty. So Shang Yu was this brave warrior. You know, he's this brave warrior and. He was on the battlefield fighting, and Liu Bang, he he took a shortcut and went and he captured the palace, the Qin Palace. So when Liu Bang captured the Qin Palace, he became the emperor. But because he was not as strong as Shang Yu or something, when Shang Yu came, Shang Yu tried to kill him and took over the kingdom. So this this stuff happened, and Liu Bang was he, he you know. He, he left and he was given like a small portion of the kingdom because of his behavior. He was given the worst part of the, of the kingdom. So Liu Bang goes through all these struggles. He lost his men. His men deserted him. He goes through this low period in his life. And then he gets a strategy. I think his name is Zhang, Zhang something. So Zhang Tang or something. You know, he gets this strategist that helps him. And they go and they wage war against Shang Yu. Or, and then... When they wage war, Liu Bang becomes the emperor. He wins the war. Liu Bang wins the war and he becomes the emperor. So when Liu Bang becomes the emperor of China, Liu Bang was the emperor of Han. He, a, a Han dynasty, the Han dynasty came into power because Liu Bang was from Han. He was from Han state. So Han was the Han dynasty. So that's where the Chinese people call themselves the Han people. The, the, the Han people come from the Han dynasty, which was founded by Liu Bang. He later on changed his name to Go, Gozo or something like that. Gaozo or Gaojo or something like that. He changed his name to Gaojo. So when he changed his name to Gaojo, Emperor Gaojo, um, he was a good ruler. He led Confucian. He hated Confucianism. But he let Confucianism uh, uh, rule the people. Um, so uh, after that, he he made the land much safer. He lowered the taxes. He was very uh, generous to people. He was very compassionate, very merciful. You know, he was all these type of things. So he became a great leader in the eyes of the Chinese people. Now, Liu Bang, when he was rising, uprising against the, the Qing dynasty, right? Liu Bang had to come up with the mandate of heaven in order for the people to join him, right? Liu Bang said that the emperor of Qin violated the mandate of heaven. He lost the mandate of heaven. So Liu Bang was the one who said the mandate was transferred to him. So when he became emperor, the people saw him as the rightful ruler of the Chinese people because the original emperor lost the mandate. You can lose the mandate in Chinese culture. So if you have the mandate, you if you screw up, if you mess up, you can lose the mandate. Other people can rise up against you. The, the Chinese people pay attention. So this is not like Africa where our leaders can do stupid stuff and they can be corrupt and nobody will, will rise up against the leader. No. In, in, the, in the Chinese society, everybody is watching for the mandate of heaven. If you violate the, the moral laws of the people, you do some corruption, you do some stuff that is against the people, the people will uprise against you. They will come out and kill you and remove you. So this is how uh, Liu Bang is able to defeat the king and, and become the emperor because the mandate of heaven, he said, the, the emperor lost the mandate of heaven because he was too cruel, he was too evil. So fast forward now, Liu Bang becomes the, uh, 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 the best, one of the best leaders of China. So, um, but then his dynasty ended. So the, the dynasty of Liu Bang was it ended in the 200 something. So after the dynasty, uh, uh, um, but he had some good, um, the, f the four 
the four best emperors of China. The four greatest emperors of China uh, is Han Wudi, Tang Taizong, um, some guy from the, 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 the Ming Dynasty, I don't know his name, uh, and who who is the other one? I think uh, Liu Bang. Liu Bang. So the four greatest emperor of China, Liu Bang, uh, 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 Tang Taizong from the Tang, the Tang Dynasty, uh, and, and uh, um, some guy from the Ming Dynasty, and uh, 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 Han Wudi. Han Wudi would be the descendant of Liu Bang. So Liu Bang's descendant is Han Wudi. Han Wudi is another of the four legendary emperors of China. Now, we fast forward. Um, this is about 265 CE, so uh, we're no longer in the BCE uh, period because the Han Dynasty came into power uh, in 202 BCE before the birth of Jesus, right? Uh, or before the Common Era. So that's when the Han Dynasty came into power. And the Han Dynasty, uh, they centralized the government, they refined it, they made Confucius the official state philosophy, um, they created a meritocracy, uh, 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 bureaucracy system, they, they even created a testing system where you had to take a test and, and, and to apply for government jobs. So uh, anybody could get into a government job if you just fill up a test, if you pass the test, right? So the the fall of the Han Dynasty was caused by 23 different rebellion that e eventually weakened the empire. So the Han Dynasty, this great dynasty that was started, then it, it became weakened. It became uh, weakened by rebellion. So the people started rebelling. So there were 23 different rebellion during this period, and the Han Dynasty weakened. So by the year 220 CE, common era to 265 uh, 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 common era. This, the, the, this period of Chinese history is called the Three Kingdoms. So, this period of Chinese history is called the Three Kingdoms. So, by the year uh, uh, um, two, uh, 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 um, 220 Common Era to 265 Common Era, the period in Chinese history is called the Three Kingdoms. So, in the Three Kingdoms, there is the, the, the Cao, or the Wei, the Shu, the Han, the, the, the Dao, and the Wu. So, the, the, the six dynasty, the, the, the three kingdoms, that's what their names. I don't don't ask me, you know, I can't pronounce their name, but the three kingdoms was three kingdoms and six dynasties. So six dynasties, three kingdoms. That was the period they call. And then this was the time when Buddhism made its entrance into China. So Buddhism, Buddhism, the religion called Buddhism that became popular in China today, right? It came during this period after the fall of the Han Dynasty and the Three Kingdom period. You see that the, 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 the Jin Dynasty came in. So the Jin Dynasty, who are the Jin? Hold on a second. Okay, so the Jin Dynasty came into this period. So we now we are at along the timeline. Now we are at the. Uh, uh, the year the the 265 CE. So this is the three kingdom period. Then the Jin Dynasty uh, come out. Who are the Jin Dynasty? The Jin Dynasty is called the the, the Jurchen. The Jurchen. Who are the Jurchen? The Jurchen are one of the minorities. The 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 minority. So they are kind of from northeastern China. So the Jurchen come from northeastern China. They are one of the the they are related to the Shounu. They are related to the Shounu, and the Shounu, who are the Shounu? The Shounu are the, they're, they're part of the confederacy of the Mongolians. So the Mongolians, all of you know who the Mongolians are, right? You all know who Genghis Khan is. Genghis Khan is from a tribe called the, the Shounu. He's descended from the Shounu. And the Shounu, they had uh, different groups in the Shounu. And part of the, the, the groups were, one of them was the Jurchen. The Jurchen, when they took over China at this period, they became known as the Jin Dynasty. So the Jin Dynasty ruled China for from uh, uh, um, 
265 CE to 420 CE. This was when the Jin Dynasty ruled. So the Jin Dynasty is called is considered by Chinese people is considered a foreign dynasty because is 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 uh the is from the Zhou and we will talk about who the Zhou Nu are. Who are the Zhou Nu? We will talk about that in a little bit. But this is what happened. The Jin Dynasty were replaced by the Sui Dynasty. So the Sui Dynasty is actually a, 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 a true Chinese dynasty. So it's a Han, it's a Han Chinese dynasty. So the Sui Dynasty is a Han Chinese dynasty, and the Jin Dynasty is a foreign dynasty. Is the 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 Jurchen, and the Jurchen are part of the foreign barbarians. They call them the outsiders of China, the barbarians. So, um, then the the Sui Dynasty unified China. So by 618 CE. Uh, China was unified again. So, after the this, the period of the Sixth uh, Dynasty, uh, the Three Kingdom period, the the Sui Dynasty brought everybody back together under one dynasty this time again. So, the Sui Dynasty unified China again, and after the Sui Dynasty, now came the Tang Dynasty and the Tang and the Song Dynasty. Uh, this is called the Golden Age of the Chinese civilization. So, the the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty. Are the consider the golden age of the Chinese civilization? So, because the Chinese people were the the, the silk, they control the Silk Road. Uh, the barbarians, or uh, the like the Shonu, the Jurchen, um, all of these people were outside. They kept them outside. Um, it was the most peaceful time in all of China. There was no war, and, and there was fairness, land reform, all type of things were happening in. Uh, this period. So the, the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty were the, the golden age of Chinese civilization. And so the, the, the Emperor Tang Taizong is considered one of the greatest emperors of China because of the golden age of, of, of the, the, the Tang Empire and the Song Dynasty as well. So now, here is where the Jurchen and the Shonu come in. And this is here where the Jurchen come in, and this is where the Shonun come in, right? So the, who are the Shonun? Who are these people called the Shonun? Okay? In Chinese history, in Chinese history, since the earliest beginning of Chinese history, now, the Chinese have always fought against the outside world, the outside people called the barbarians. Chinese people call themselves the civilized people, and everybody else was barbarians. The same way the Romans used to say, Rome was the center of civilization, and everybody else in the world was barbarians, right? The Chinese says the same thing. They say, Chinese are the center of the world, and everybody else in the world is barbarians. And one of these barbarians, the most, eh, 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 the one that gave China the hardest time, were called the Shonu. The Shonu of were called the they were the hardest people. So they were they had a very weird relationship with the Chinese. Sometimes they were the slaves of the Chinese, sometimes they were the oppressors of the Chinese. It was sometimes they were marrying the Chinese, sometimes they were the vassal state of the Chinese. Sometimes they, they, they gave them tribute. Sometimes, you know, basically China at that time they would they would get uh, this relationship called the tribute relationship with people. So they, they have a vassal state. Now, what is a vassal state? A vassal state meaning that you serve a, 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 another state. So let me give you an example of what a vassal state is. Nigeria is a vassal state of Britain. Britain controls Nigeria. Britons decide the future of Nigeria. So Nigeria is a vassal state of Britain. Liberia is a vassal state of America. So Liberia is a, is a servant of America. Nigeria is a servant of Great Britain. That's what a vassal state is. When you are a vassal, you are basically in a servant and, and, and leader relationship. In China, Chinese consider themselves the supreme power and everybody else were a vassal state. The barbarians were vassals. And the Vietnamese were vassals of the Chinese. The, the Cambodians, all these other groups, the, all these different people were all vassals of the Chinese. The Koreans were, were put into vassal relationship with the Chinese. Um, these are the things that the Chinese people were doing. They would put these other people into vassal relationship. So 
the Shonu, sometimes they would conquer China, and sometimes China would conquer them. Sometimes the Shonu would uh, 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 intermarry with Chinese, and sometimes the Chinese would build a great wall to keep the Shonu out. So it was a it was a mix of love and hate relationship. is a is a constant love and hate relationship with the Shonu. Now the Shonu. They are a confederacy of people. The confederacy means it's a group of people. So in Liberia, you have about 16 tribes, right? So the Shonu is a blanket is a blanket terminology for smaller groups of people. So there is a confederacy. One, one, one leader managed to unify the Shonu. One of the leaders managed to unify the Shonu and they became a unified group and they were very powerful and when they were powerful at this time they were actually able to conquer the Chinese people when they got united they were able to conquer the Chinese people so majority of what the Chinese people were doing against the barbarians was the Chinese people were manipulating the barbarians spreading division amongst them so you see how the West does in Africa right the West fuels the fire of tribalism in Africa, they fuel the fire of terrorism in Africa, they keep Africans fighting each other, they pay this group to go and raid this group, to, to do this, they're paying people to go and fight wars, to keep Africans divided so Africans can't come together. So the way the West is doing it, China used to do that same thing to the, uh, uh, to the people before, to the Zhounu. So the Chinese people used to manipulate the Zhounu. They, they kept the Shonu fighting against each other so the Shonu can never unite. Who united all of the, 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 the people of Mongolia? The person that united all the people of Mongolia is called Chinggis Khan. Chinggis Khan came and he united all the people and then he took his revenge on the Chinese people. Shonu, uh, 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 Chinggis Khan defeated the Song Dynasty and he took over the Song Dynasty etc and made it his, the, his state. So the Sui, the, 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 the Tang, and the Song, all of them were defeated. The Mongols came, and the Mongols created a dynasty called the, Ye, the, the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty. Now, the Yuan Dynasty is the dynasty which uh, 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 Marco Polo, he, when he went to uh, down the Silk Road, I, I'm sure all of you have read Marco Polo's journey on the Silk Road. Marco Polo talks about his journey on the Silk Road when he went through the mountains of Afghanistan, Iran, all these places, and he went to the court of Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan is the grandson of Genghis Khan. Kublai Khan was the ruler of the Yuan dynasty, and he ruled China. He, they defeated the Song dynasty, they consolidated the Song dynasty. So this is a period where Chinese people call foreigners ruling them. The, the Chinese people view foreigners as oppressors. So the Chinese people have a lens of viewing foreigners as oppressors. The Chinese don't like foreigners because they see foreigners as oppressors. Unlike Africans, Africans love foreigners. Africans, you know, everybody want to, you want to hug a foreigner. You want to say, oh, here are my children. I bring all my children for you to play and touch with my children. No, the, these, these people are foreigners. They are oppressors. That's how it's, it's seen in the Chinese, the Chinese lens. African people, we bring our kids, we come and we start dancing and we're shaking and we're beating the drum and bringing the white man in, bringing the Asian, bringing the Arab man in. That's how African people behave. The Chinese, they don't do that stuff. You are a foreigner, you are an oppressor. It's done. Clo case closed. Okay? So now, fast forward. Now the UN dynasty, they, 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 they are dominating the Chinese people, but the Chinese people are quiet. The Chinese people are quiet. You know why the Chinese people are quiet? Because they tell themselves that these foreigners will leave one day. These foreigners will not last. They will oppress us for a few hundred years, but then when they leave, we will continue as we were. So, there is a story in the Chinese culture. There is a story in the Chinese culture. There is a person called Gojin. Gojin, I don't... Um, he was living during the time of Sun Tzu, so during the Warring State period. I think he was living during the Warring State period. So, Gojin, this this guy named Gojin, he's I think, the, 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 if you want to understand the mind of a Chinese, if you want to understand the mind of a Chinese, Gojin is how Chinese people think. 
The way Gojin thinks, that's how Chinese people think. So here's Gojin. What, what happened to Gojin? Gojin was this guy during the Warring State period. He was defeated, you know. And when he was defeated, he was taken captive by the Zhou dynasty. And when he was taken, he, uh, he was from the Wei dynasty. Gojin was from the Wei dynasty. He was defeated by the, the Zhou dynasty. And the Zhou dynasty kept him hostage. Him and his wife were slaves. So this king of the, the, the Wei dynasty was taken as a slave to the Zhou dynasty. And he was in the palace of the, uh, the Zhou dynasty. He was a slave. So he was such a good slave. He convinced everybody in the palace that he was such a good slave. The, the people got scared. They said, we got to kill him. The, the, the advisor of the emperors got scared. They said, we got to kill him. So when they say we got to kill him, this man, and Gojin, Gojin went to the emperor's room. He took the emperor's poop. He took the, 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 the king's poop and he tasted it. When he tasted the poop, he said, oh, you have so-and-so sickness. And the sickness will cure, it will, it will go away. So the emperor was sick and nobody could find out what, nobody knew the cure for the emperor. This Gojin guy went, he tasted the poop of the emperor, and then when he tasted the poop of the emperor, then he said, you know what? You are now, uh, uh, here's some remedy for you to get better. So when the emperor got better, the emperor said, this guy saved my life. Gojin saved my life. So the emperor released Gojin. I actually love this story. So the emperor released Gojin. Gojin went back to Wei. When Gojin went back to Wei, you know what Gojin did? Gojin refused to sleep in the royal bed. He started sleeping on straws. And he used to taste, uh, uh, they say gall, gallstones or something. Um, you know, he started tasting gallstones and he would sleep on straw. Because they, he wanted the bitter taste to remain in his mouth. Because of the humiliation he suffered under the, the zoo, right? He wanted to remember the humiliation so he would taste the gallstone. So he would be... Um, he would be laying on the straw. This king, this this king, would be laying in this on the straws, these hard straws, and he would be tasting the gallstone to remind him of what he, the humiliation he suffered in the zoo. And you know what he did? He pretended to be a friend to the zoo, and he led to their defeat. He systematically. I've never seen a strategy. I never ever read in a book of a, of a person with such a superior strategy to disable another people. I mean, this guy, some of the strategy he used, it was out of this world. He started giving this person so much a, a natural resource. And he caused this person to exhaust all their money. And when, the, and when this, uh, this other kingdom exhausted all their money, then he, he bought all the food supplies. He said there was a famine in his land. And he bought all the rice from that kingdom, causing the kingdom to collapse. This guy systematically planned the defeat of his enemy. Slowly, patiently, he, he bided his time. He bared his time until he defeated his enemy. So the Chinese have a philosophy where it says, You suffer today, you endure humiliation and suffering so that you can enjoy tomorrow. So this is the culture that all Chinese people are taught. The Gojin, the story of Gojin. I don't know, tasting, uh, uh, sleeping on straw and tasting gall. Sleeping on straw and tasting gall, which translate is, you, you suffer today, you endure hardship today, so that you can get your revenge later. So this is the stuff that China went through. You see how China was colonized by the West. China was colonized by the West. China was, it went through some stuff, but the Chinese were patient. Why were they patient? Because Gojin, the story of Gojin, every Chinese person knows this. The Chinese people know the story of Gojin. You have to suffer, you have to endure hardship, but if you endure hardship with patience, if you are patient, you will, you will get your revenge, you will destroy your enemy. And this is what brought the Chinese people to 2021, this mentality. 
So the Chinese people are an extremely patient people. They can endure hardship. They endure the Jin dynasty. They endure the Yuan dynasty. They endure the Ming dynasty. And the, the Ming dynasty was the Manchu. The Manchu are the people from Manchuria. So northeastern China, and there's a part of northeastern China called Manchuria. That's what it is next to Russia. So this area, the people that live in this area, they have reindeers. They have these you know, most people ride horses. These people ride reindeers. So it's, it's like they go all the way to Russia. So the Manchu, where they had a dynasty in China called the Ming Dynasty. And I think one of the, the emperor of the, the Ming Dynasty was one of the greatest emperor of China. So you see, so that means that the Ming Dynasty, um, I, yeah, it's the Ming Dynasty. So the Ming Dynasty was a Manchu. And I think the Qin Dynasty after that was also a Manchu. So the Chinese people themselves, they have gone through foreign rule. The Yuan dynasty was a foreign rule of Mongolians. Then the, the Jurchen, then after the Jurchen, then the Manchu. After the Manchu, then you came to uh, 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 the, Qin, the, 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 the Qin dynasty, which is again Manchu. But guess now, what year are we on the timeline of the Chinese people? What, where are we at on the timeline? So. The Tang Dynasty was from 700 all the way to 1100, right? So then the 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 the, the Jin Dynasty from there uh, all the way to the Yuan Dynasty, which is about we're about 13 1400 now. Now we reach to 1600. We have the Ming Dynasty from 15 to 1600 is the Ming Dynasty. Then after the Ming Dynasty, you have the last dynasty, which is the Qing Dynasty, the, the Qin Dynasty, the last Qin Dynasty. Um, so, now you're at 1800. We're at 1918. So this is the time when Europeans were coming around the world in, in Africa. So this is the slavery, when the slave trade was going on, um, all these things were happening. These are, are parallel. This is what was happening in China. So, the Qing, the Qing Dynasty now, um, the, 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 what you call it, um, the Westerners, the, 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 the Qing Dynasty and the Century of Humiliation. So they call this part of the Chinese history, the Century of Humiliation. The, this part of the Chinese history under the Qing Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty is called the Century of Humiliation. Why is it called the Century of Humiliation? The century of humiliation is the period of subjugation of the Qing Dynasty and the Republic of China by Western powers, including Japan. So during the period of the Qing, the Qing Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty suffered a great humiliation to the Chinese pride. So mind you, the Chinese people have a pride that's huge. The Chinese people have a pride. They are very prideful people. They have the, the Chinese sense of honor, the Chinese sense of pride, the Chinese sense of you know economics, Chinese sense of social culture, all these things they have it. But the pride of the Chinese said that if you, if you as the Chinese are the son of heaven, if you as the, the emperor are the son of heaven, and a foreign power come. And they have the son of heaven, the son of God. They're oppressing the son of God. That's his, that's humiliation. So the Qin dynasty, the Qin dynasty of 1800, the, the, the Europeans came now. The first group to, 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 to was the Germans. The, the, the Germans came. They wanted to partition uh, 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 China. So you know how in 1884... That the, the, the Germans got together and they partitioned Africa, they divided Africa among themselves. The Europeans got together and divided Africa among themselves. The Europeans were going to divide China amongst themselves. So the Europeans had a plan to divide China amongst themselves in the 1800s. And during this period, they, they were going to divide China, but then America, the United States of America, there was this American. He told all the leaders of Europe, he said, no, let's keep China as it is, but let's trade with them. So instead of all of us going together into Berlin and then we divide China up, we draw the map and each person cut up China. Let's not do that. 
let's just trade with them. Let's make them trade with us by force. Let's force them to trade with us. So the, the Europeans were more interested in trading with the Chinese people. They wanted it because the Chinese people had a large population or massive population and the Europeans wanted to sell their goods to the Chinese and they wanted to give their material things to the Chinese and the Chinese didn't want their goods. So the Chinese emperor of the, of the Qin dynasty sent the Queen of Victoria a letter. He sent Queen Victoria a letter. He said, hey, we don't want your product. We don't want to trade with you guys. We have everything you, you can make. We already invented it. We have guns. We have uh, 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 silk. We have all the things. We don't need nothing with you. So the British people got upset. When the Chinese people wrote their queen and they told the queen and say, hey, we don't want to trade with you guys. We don't like you guys like that. The British people got upset. They started selling opium. The East Indian Company. There's the company here. Go look it up. The East Indian Company. The East Indian Company was occupying India at that time, in the Southern Asia. And as they were occupying India, they were growing something called opium. And during this period, they, they got the entire population, majority of the Chinese people addicted to opium. So the British sold their opium to the Chinese. And they got all the Chinese people addicted to opium. So the Chinese became like drug addict. The military, everybody was doing drugs. So when the emperor found out and the emperor seized the shipment of opium and destroyed it, the British people came and they went to war with the Chinese people. But the, 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 the British defeated the Chinese. When the British defeated the Chinese, the Chinese were forced to submit to the British. So the Chinese were forced to submit to the British people. So the, the opium war, the first opium war was 1839 to 1842. That's when the opium war started. So when the British East India Company, who was uh, 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 opposed to the one-sided trade arrange, uh, arrangement with the King Empire, they decided that you know they would sell opium to balance the trade deficit. So the East India Company started using smugglers to sell a uh, highly addictive narcotics so the east indian company started selling highly addictive narcotics like opium to the chinese people which was illegal according to chinese law so the british people were breaking chinese law so which led to mass addiction in the society the chinese society was completely addicted to opium so when the chinese tried to appeal to the, the queen of the british she didn't care. So the Chinese took action and they stopped the British. They seized their vessel and they burned the vessel. They blocked the trade routes uh, uh, and they began re rehabilitating their people. So the Chinese people began rehabilitating their people. But the British government got angry. And the British government said, Who told you to rehabilitate our customers? Who told you to stop our trade? And all these things. So the British, they went to war with the Chinese. And they defeated the Chinese military and forced them to submit. So the Chinese, after the Chinese were defeated, the Chinese, the, the Treaty of Nanking, the Treaty of Nanking, gave the British full impunity and extra rights into the Chinese economy. So this period is called the humiliation, the century of humiliation in Chinese history. So. If you, if you, the, so a lot of Africans don't know this, but the Chinese, the Chinese call this the century of humiliation. And to make things worse, Hong Kong, the, the, the land of Hong Kong, it was given to the British as part of the Treaty of Nanking. So the British demanded this, the, the Hong Kong, that, that place you call Hong Kong today where the protesters are. The British demanded Hong Kong as part of the, 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 the treaty. And look at this. How are these people going to come to your country and defeat you in a war? Then they say, give us your territory. This is the same thing that happened in Southern Africa and other parts of Africa where the British did this. So they did it to the Chinese people too. So it's not just Africa that they did it to. They did it to the Chinese as well. So when the British weren't satisfied with the, with the Chinese, they wanted more access to the trade, right? So the British got greedy. After they got Hong Kong, they wanted more market share in the Chinese market. So the second opium war started in 1856 all the way to 1860, which had a side effect of creating a Chinese rebellion against the Qin Empire. So this is where the Chinese people got extremely angry at the emperor. 
the Chinese people got extremely angry at the emperor. First of all, the Chinese people were already saying that the Manchu were foreigners. These people from Manchuria, the Jurchen, the, the, the Shonu, these were already foreigners as it is, the Jin, they were already foreigners. Then on top of that, these foreigners who are in power allow the British to defeat them and take a whole province. And then once the British take the province, then the British gets greedy again, and then the British starts waging another war on the Chinese. So the Chinese people got upset, and the, in the, in the, the age of rebellion started. So during the 1800, on top of fighting the British, the French, the German, on top of fighting them, the Japanese, on top of fighting uh, the, the Italians, even the Italians, after the Italians were defeated by the Ethiopians, the Italians went to China and they said, we want your territory. We want a piece of your land. So the German took a piece of the, the, the Chinese people land. The Russians took some of the Chinese people land. The, 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 uh, the, the British took Chinese people land. The French took people Chinese land. The Portuguese took Chinese people land. Today, Macau, the island of Macau was occupied by the, the Portuguese. So the Chinese people had their land taken by the same way Africa was taken, where they came and they divided Africa up, the Germans just took it. They didn't care. The Portuguese took it. The, the Italians went to go get their own too. You know, it was the Americans who's like, no, we're not going to divide them up. The Russians came. The Russians took Manchuria. So the Chinese people at this point, they, they felt like a failure and they were angry at the emperor. So the rebellion started. So during this age, you had the, the yellow turban rebellion or the red turban, whatever you call it. All these, the Muslim rebellion, all kinds of rebellion was happening. And But the most famous rebellion of all these rebellion, the most famous rebellion that happened during this period was called the Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion created the rise of the modern Chinese Communist Party. So it was because of the Taiping Rebellion that the, the, the rise of the modern Chinese Communist Party exists today. So it was because of the Taiping Rebellion that created the modern Chinese Communist Party. Okay, And the current Chinese nationalism you see. So the nationalism you look at China having in 2021, it was coming out of this Taiping Rebellion. And the leader of the Taiping was Hong Xuan or Hong Xuan or whatever. And he proclaimed himself the brother of Jesus Christ. So Hong Xuan said he was the brother of Jesus Christ. Hong Xuan decided to convert China to Christianity. He wanted to create stronger nationalism and political power. So his goal was to convert all of Chinese to one religion, which was Christianity, because he, he said he was the brother of Jesus Christ. So he wanted to convert all Chinese to one religion and one political party. So that's where the Taiping Rebellion started. He said he was the brother of Jesus. And there were rebellions all over the place, like generals, people were rebelling, the Muslims were rebelling, the Turk, all these people were rebelling in the empire. The empire was collapsing. So the Taiping, they called themselves the Heavenly Kingdom, right? They, that's what they call the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. That's what they call themselves. So from 1850 to 1864, the bloodiest war in Chinese history, the bloodiest war, 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 the bloodiest war in human, uh, well, is it human? No, not human history. Is it, is it human? Yeah, in world history. The bloodiest war in, hum, in, in history was the civil war between the, 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 the Taiping Rebellion and the Ming. Uh, um, the Taiping Rebellion cost 70 million Chinese lives. 70 million Chinese people died to bring forth a new revolution of nationalism and communalism, communism. So 70 million Chinese people died during the Taiping Revolution. So Africans, those of us who talk about revolution, you want revolution. You want to be free from the colonial yoke. Do you have 70 million Africans to give up? Do you have 70 million African people to give up? If you don't have 70 million African lives to put down for Africa freedom, 
Don't compare yourself to the Chinese. Because the Taiping Rebellion, 70 million Chinese people died in order for the Communist Party to come into birth. For the Communist Party to be born, 70 million people had to die for, the, for them to give birth to the Communist Party and the nationalism that Chinese people have today. So, at the end of the Taiping Rebellion, the Qing Dynasty was weakened to the point, right, it caused regional fragmentation. Then, Russia annexed Manchuria. Russia came, they annexed Manchuria. Italy was trying to colonize China. Uh, uh, Japan and the, and, the, and the Westerners attempted to colonize China. The Portuguese, they took uh, uh, Macau, the Chinese people's land. So the British took Hong Kong, the Portuguese took Macau, the French came and, and, and waged war against the Chinese. The Chinese were being attacked by everybody. The Germans, the British, the French, all the Europeans came together. They said we will partition Africa uh, uh, China. And who, who actually stopped them? It was America. America said, let's keep them as a trade partner. So this is what the Chinese people went through during the century of humiliation. So now you come forward to the Japanese. When the Japanese decided they were going to come and get their piece of the cake. So now <laughs> the Chinese people are fighting the, 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 Ming, uh, the, the, Qing, the Qing dynasty is, go, it is done. Now the, there is a civil war, a full civil war between Kumoteng versus the, the Republic of China. So the ROP uh, 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 versus the Communist Party. So the, the Kumoteng uh, 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 Republic of China versus the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party. So the civil war between the Kumoteng uh, 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 Party and the Chinese Communist Party occurred during this period like, um, um, you know, it was, it was happening from 1927 to 1937. So the Chinese people had been fighting all this war. So the what happened was the 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 the, the leaders of these two groups. One of the leader is called Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek is the leader of the founder of Taiwan. So the Kuomintang they ran away to 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 the, the 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 place we call Taiwan today. So if you hear about Chinese don't like the Taiwanese uh, and, and in Swaziland I think uh, uh, Swaziland, they have a partnership with the, the Taiwanese, so China doesn't go to, to Swaziland because of the partnership that they have with uh, Taiwan. So this is the, where this, this relationship comes from. Uh, the Chinese Republic broke into two people. One group became Taiwan, and the other group became the, 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 the Communist Party of uh, 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 the People's Republic of China. So Taiwan versus mainland China, this was the war that was happening. This was the civil war. Um, you know, from that spilled over and through the years. Now, Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Kai-shek was the leader of the Taiwan uh, uh, people, and Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong was the leader of mainland China. So they were fighting in the civil war against each other. But then, guess what happened? Guess what happened? The Japanese people decided to invade China, and when the Japanese people decided to invade China, Guess what happened? What uh, 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 Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong did? Mao Zedong went to Chiang Kai-shek. Mao Zedong went to Chiang Kai-shek. He said, "You, we will stop fighting. Let's create a treaty. Let's create a treaty. Two Chinese people are fighting to, to see who will win. But when they recognized the Japanese people were coming into China to invade and take over China, what did the, the, the Chinese do? Mao Zedong and, and Chiang Kai-shek came together and they formed a treaty, an alliance. Mao Zedong, this is the quote of Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong said, for the good of the nation, for the good of the nation, I will serve, I will let you be the leader. Mao Zedong made the ultimate sacrifice. He made the ultimate sacrifice for the good of the Chinese nation. He said, I will serve his, he, he went to his enemy. Have you ever seen an African president go to his enemy and say, for the good of the African people, I will serve you? Have you ever seen such a thing happen in human existence? African people don't have this kind of thinking. We don't think about for the good of the people, for the good of the nation. African people don't think like this. There is no good of the nation. 
your uh, my pride if i hate my brother i'm fighting against my brother and a foreigner come we will the foreigner has to kill both of us africans will not stop africans are the type of people they won't stop to help their brother they won't submit to their brother even if they're under the death threat of a foreigner they won't do it but the chinese are different mao zedong went to Chiang Kai Chek and he said i submit to you let's join forces and deal with the japanese when we defeat the japanese we will get back to our fight and guess what they they form an alliance and then they went on to defeat to, to move the japanese people so you see this after the japanese people are gone they went back to fighting each other again now i'm trying to let the african people know right this war this war between the the the, the, the these two people the casualties were in the high millions i mean like the total deaths of chinese people the total or uh, uh, number of chinese people that died 55 million died okay so during this period from 1945 to 1962 55 million chinese people died so 70 million who died during the the the, the taiping rebellion and then 55 million chinese people died during the civil war so Think about it. That's a how much how much million? 70 million plus 55 million. How much is that? 120 million Chinese people died to unify China. 120 million people, Chinese people died to unify China. And I see Africans comparing ourselves to the Chinese. Well, yo, the Chinese did it. We can do it too the Chinese did it we can do it too but do you do you are you do you, you have 70 million people to, or 100 million or 120 million people are you willing to die to, to unify Africa are we willing are, are 170 million Africans willing to die for the unity of Africa is there 170 million Africans willing to die for the unity of Africa no that's not one african isn't even ready to die you say 70 170 120 million 120 million the population of liberia is 5 million 5 million the population of ivory coast is 12 million or, or something are you kidding me you would have to double 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 that's how many people die to unify the the chinese people to where they are today so when you when when people are saying oh the chinese people did it oh we can do it too i'm not saying that the african people can do it but are you willing to pay the price to be free from the europeans are you willing to pay the price to be free from colonial masters are you willing to be pay the price for unity of africa do you have 120 million african lives to give up for unity do you have that life to spare if you don't have that many lives to spare then you gotta you gotta think you gotta be able to use your brain use your brain let's continue um so when the chinese went through this right after all this period they came together they lost 120 million people for them to be able to do what they did today now the, the, the chairman of the Communist Party, the Mao Zedong, right, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. You know, many Africans like to talk about uh, China, and they like to say, oh, if China do it, we can do it. China is this. But Mao Zedong, here are some things that Mao Zedong is known for. Mao Zedong coined a phrase called Han Chauvinism. Han Chauvinism. Now, Remember, I told you guys that China has 55 ethnic groups. 55 ethnic groups. The majority, 91% of them, consider themselves Han Chinese. And I told you that the Yuan Dynasty was a foreign dynasty. The, the um, Ming Dynasty and the, and the Qing Dynasty was foreign dynasty. So Chinese people recognize these people as foreigners. Even though these people were born in China and they live in China and they were there. Yeah. But Chinese people recognize your bloodline. Remember I said that they go back to the Yellow Emperor. 
they go back to uh, 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 Yu Yugong. They go back to uh, 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 Luobang, Luobang, uh, uh, Liobang. They go back to all these people. So technically, technically, the Chinese people view everybody else as foreigners, foreigners, barbarians. We are all considered barbarians to them. So when they when them when these other group of people in china was like they're like no even though there are 55 ethnic group we don't recognize you guys because you don't have the same bloodline as our ancestor and the yellow emperor or you don't have the same uh, bloodline from the shia now with this Mao said don't have to speak against the ethnic tribalism he called it the han chauvinism so Mao Zedong and, 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 and he criticized his own people. He said, um, you guys who are so intolerant of the minorities, you know, and you criticize them, how are we going to have unity? How are you going to have a unity, a common, a, a one party system, a communist party that will work a, 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 a for the good of the Chinese people if you have problem with the other ethnic group? You know, and Mao Zedong criticized his own people for this stuff here. He stood in front of the the, 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 the Communist Party and he said, and, and these are chauvinistic ideas, these Han superiority, you can't have superiority inside of China. The superiority is outside of China against non-Chinese. The superiority shouldn't be for the Chinese, you know. So Mao Zedong has it, he, he said, for the good of the nation, that's that was something he said and then he said you guys you know so you see the leadership example many Africans want to compare themselves oh Mao Zedong Mao Zedong you know yes Mao Zedong did mess up with that uh, uh, um what you call it his plan um uh, uh the famine plan you know that uh, um the, the 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 plan that he had that caused the death of many um but what I'm trying to say is many Chinese rejected multi-racial nationalism in China. Many Chinese were against the non-Han bloodline. If you didn't have a Han ethnic bloodline, right? Chinese people didn't like you. They rejected you. They call you a foreigner. They didn't trust you. So the Manchus, the Mongols, the Tibetans, the Turkic Muslim, the all these people are who are part of China. But the, the, the Han Chinese, they don't like these people. They call these people oppressors. Even the white white people, they call the white people oppressors. You guys don't know that. You don't know that about the Chinese, but the Chinese call the white people oppressors. And so what I'm trying to get you, uh, the African people, to understand about the Chinese. Chinese people understand China's role in Africa. You know, now, whatever the Chinese people say to you, the Chinese people still consider you inferior. They still consider are you inferior because they have a supreme philosophy themselves. They have their mandate. They have their history. They have their, their Sinocentrism. They already have their way of life. So all their aid policy and all that stuff about we don't interfere with government and we loan loan to you, right? You are still inferior in their eyes. So if they're coming on your on your continent and they are destroying your forest, and rooting your ancestors and purging your ancestors' spirit from the land. The Chinese, are, are, are they, they are going to do that. They don't care about Africa. Africa is, they don't like Africans. They never did. You know, so it's not a saying, I'm not saying that we should hate the Chinese people. I'm saying that we don't have to like them either. I'm saying we don't have to, um, you know, give our land, our forest to them, right? One thing I noticed about the African continent, our leaders, we, our people, we love money. And I keep warning you guys in all my lectures, I said money is not good. Money, is, it, money might be good for us to use, right? But money, you can't sell your forest for money. You can't sell your natural resource for paper money. Africans are, we, we do things that are very stupid. And these Chinese people, they look at us. And they say these people are inferior because look at how they, they, they look at themselves. Look at how they think of themselves. They have a Sinocentrism. They are the political, economical center of the world, spiritual center of the world. And Africans, you don't see yourself as any of those things. You hate your black skin. People in the Congo are bleaching. People in Nigeria are bleaching. 
you hate your black skin. The Chinese love their, their, their yellow skin. They love the color yellow. They try to be white and yellow. That's what they try to be. And Africans, you should be trying to be who you are. Preserve who you are. But you, are, you don't have Afrocentrism. You don't have the feeling that African, being African, is the center of the universe, of the world. You don't have it. And only the organic African paradigm can teach you these type of things. You will not know these things unless the organic African paradigm is there to teach you. And this is, many Africans are thinking, you think you're going to go and, oh, will you, because you read uh, 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 the communist uh, uh, of, of Marxist, you Marxism, because you think the Chinese adopted Marxism, and that means that, you know, all of a sudden everything is peachy and cream because you think the Chinese are You don't know their story. The Chinese people have a pride that is unmatched. Gojin, the story of Gojin, the Chinese people live the philosophy of Gojin. They are careful, they are quiet, they plan in silence, in stealth. And before you know it, when the time comes, they will destroy you. And this is what's waiting for Africa. Africa, these people are coming now. They're coming today, right? But in 200 years, Africa will be exterminated. Africa, Africans won't own the land. All your ancestors will be killed. You know what these people do when they, when they, when they, when they dig in the soils? You know what they do? They purify the soil. They kill the ghost of your ancestors. They, 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 they don't want your ancestor spirit in that land. They don't want any kind of African spirit in that land. So they do stuff to remove that African spirit. They remove your ancestor. They're in the, uh, they're in the Congo. They're in South Africa. They're doing all these things. Now, I'm not telling you any of these for you to have hate for the Chinese. Listen to me carefully. I'm not saying hate anyone. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you as an African need your organic African paradigm. You need to learn to love yourself to the same degree that they love themselves. And when you love yourself to that degree, you will not sell your forest. You will not sell your land. You will not sell the, the souls of your ancestors, the, the atoms of your ancestors. You won't sell it for paper money. You know, this is the thing that is very, very uh, uh, concerning for the African people. You know, all, uh, this is when, when Africans hear this stuff here, their mouth starts drooling. Yes, China has 18 of the top banks in the world. Yes, I know that. China has 18 of the top banks in the world. Yes, I know the asset, the total asset of China is $23.76 trillion in total asset. Yes, I know that. But what I'm trying to tell you as an African, even if the person has $23 trillion and 18 banks, you, it shouldn't matter to you. Your job is to create your own banks. And put your own $23 trillion in that bank. Why don't you have your $23 trillion in that bank? You keep borrowing money from foreigners. You keep going to the, uh, these people and borrowing loans. You don't know the history of these people. You don't know the history of the Europeans. Even though you've known them for, for, for so many years. You've known the Arabs for so many years. But you can't learn. Because you, you're always... You're always Africans, listen to me. You have to think for your, your future. There were, I told you when I started this lecture. The ancestors of the Chinese used to be black. They were, the who were the ancestors of the Chinese? I said the Dogon and the Khoisan people were the ancestors of the Chinese. The Dogon of Mali and the Khoisan of South Africa, they are the ancestors of the Chinese. But the Chinese eradicated their bloodline they bred with they, 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 they bred all the black people out of existence they bred them out of existence and now only the white people are there and now they're coming to Africa with their money and you as an African your hand is out like like you know like your hand is out like some desperate and the Chinese are very intelligent people don't underestimate them I have studied their history. I just told you that I have summarized their history. And I told you about Gojin. Gojin's philosophy is 
you 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 patient you attack your enemy you 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 suffer slowly you endure hardship so that you can you defeat your enemy this is golden philosophy and how many africans we are willing to go through that how many africans are willing to endure hardship so that we can achieve something greater in the future no how many africans are willing to give up 100 million lives how many africans are willing to give up 100 million lives so that we can be unified no one wants to die no one wants to give up life how are we going to unify you think we will be unit united you think africans will come together like this this unity that we are talking about the Europeans will never allow it so easily. The Europeans won't allow it. The Chinese won't allow it. The Arabs won't allow it. This is why the organic African paradigm is the most essential philosophy of understanding. This is why the teachings of the organic African paradigm are so vital. You know, when I tell you guys, go to the YouTube channel, subscribe, bring Africans to the YouTube channel and get them to watch these lectures. People ignore me. You know, when I ask you guys to listen to these lectures on the YouTube channel, learn about what you need to know. Know thyself. Know that environment. Know the enemy. You know, the lectures, people aren't watching it. People aren't going through it. Africans, you want to compare yourself to the Chinese. But you don't even have self-discipline. You don't you lack self-discipline. Like it's it's so to me it's 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 a comedy when I think when I hear our people talking about oh you know like so and so like it's a comedy. You lack self-discipline. The level of discipline these people have, all the weeks that they sell Africans. All the things that they sell Africans, they cut our forest, they kill our animals. You can't go to China and kill animals. You can't go and go cut a forest. You pay no African on planet Earth. Let me say this again. No African on the entire planet Earth. No African, not the, the highest African can go to China and pay the Chinese government to cut down a forest. No African. I'm telling you this. No, I mean, it, Africans, you, you are, to, to them you are inferior. To them you are inferior. You will never be their equal until you become their equal. Until you become their equal, you will never be their equal. Meaning that the same level they're on, you have to get there and the only way you can get there is for you to exist in your natural identity blueprint for you to live in your organic african paradigm for you to learn how to become a great african how to become an elite how to become the best version of an african all of these other stuff pan-africanism you know i like to come back to pan-africanism because when we talk i see a lot of people quoting the chinese Oh, uh, 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 the Chinese president said, it doesn't matter what kind of cat it is. If it catches a mouse, it catches a mouse. You know, people like to quote the, 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 the president on this stuff. You say, oh, if it catches a mouse, it catches a mouse. We don't, you know, like, let me tell you guys something. I want you guys to really understand this very carefully. Hang on a second. Bear with me one second. When when Dao Xiaoping, what, what is his name? Dao uh, 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 Dong Xiaoping or whatever his name is. Um, when when Dong Xiaoping said a mouse or a black cat or a white cat, as long as he catches a mouse, Dong Bao Dong Xiaoping already understood the sacrifice that the people had made. He already understood the hundred and uh, one hundred and twenty million deaths that the Chinese people people died for them to be unified. 120 million people died 
for them to be unified. 120 million. I don't even think the state of, uh, 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 the, uh, let me see what the state of Texas, how, what's the population of Texas? Hang on, let me Google the population of Texas. Because y'all need to understand this, man. Hang on, let me Google the population of Texas. Twenty nine million. The population of Texas it says twenty nine million. The population of California is thirty nine million. The population of Florida is 21 million. So you have to combine the population of Texas, California, and Florida in order for you to have the number of Chinese people that die in order for you to have unification. So when we're talking about African unity, people, you need to take it seriously. You need to take it seriously. So I'm going to be ending my lecture here and before I end the lecture, I want to give you guys the solution for Africa. Here is the solution. The solution is the organic African paradigm. You need to learn how to become Afrocentric. You need to learn how, as an African, you put your, com your people first. You put your black skin, your dark skin, above all other skin in this world. Even if you don't feel like you should, you should love your skin. You should be take pride in keeping your race black. You should take pride in keeping your race the color it is. You should work effort tirelessly, deliberately, intentionally to keep your people the way they are, to elevate your people in their own paradigm. Because if you think that the Chinese are coming to Africa to be our friends, to be our lovers, they're coming there to remove you from the land. They will remove you from the land. There are people that are very committed to their culture. They are committed to their way of life. They have no desire for us becoming off buddy. That, that stuff is not happening. We're not going to be moving to China and be living in China with them. It's not going to happen. They're going to be moving from China, coming into our lands, and they're going to be the ones living with us. And they're going to keep increasing and increasing and increasing. And eventually, they're going to control the economical, the political, and the social structure of the African world. And by the time you wake, all of you wake up, by the time you decide you want your organic African paradigm, guess what? It'll be too late. And then you will pay the price. And then when you lose that 120 million African lives, then African people will become serious. Then that's when a woman, an African woman, when she raised her child, the first thing she won't teach her child is how to dance. When an African man, he won't behave like a child. He won't focus on what his, his, his genitals can get him in his life. He won't focus what his stomach can get him. He will focus on what is mine. These are the things that will happen. They, this is the future that's waiting for you. I just narrated the entire story of the Chinese people. The Chinese people have fought consistently, continuously to keep their unity. They will always rise. Anytime you defeat the Chinese, they will always come back stronger. You can't defeat them. They will come back stronger. The strategy that Europe used on, on, on Africa, the Chinese are using that strategy today. And when the time they're done with that strategy, Africans, you will find yourself in a very, very uncomfortable situation. You will find this, and the African woman, you will be crying every day. Your, your, your womb will be a place of tears when you watch what's happening to your children. You will, your womb will be a place of tears when you start seeing what will be happening to your children in the future. This is why African people, you need to be more disciplined. You need to learn these ways of life, the organic African paradigm way of life. You need to learn these lectures, the school of thought. The organic African paradigm, when I talk about unity, when I say the organic African paradigm can unify the African people, it's, it's because I have this knowledge, it's because I've studied these people, because I understand them. How many Pan-Africans do you see are out there studying these people all in and out, 
reading their whole history, learning about their ancestors. How many? They're on your continent killing your ancestors in the soil, removing their bodies from the soil, destroying whole forests. And they're doing these things. The Japanese, the Koreans, they're all under the Sinosphere culture. If I had if this lecture, I couldn't make it too long. Because if I had more time, I would have sat here and narrated the Korean story and the Japanese story. And you guys know I will do that. I will narrate the Japanese story and the Korean story. I don't care. I will narrate the story of India, Vietnam. I will narrate the story of Russia. I will narrate the story of the Arabs. I will sit here and tell you the story if I have to. So that you as an African can get some sense. You need to grow up. You need to be serious. You need to be more disciplined. And the organic African paradigm is the only teaching that will allow you to help your people, help your continent. You need to work very fast and hard so that we wake our people up. Because by the time the Chinese get a hold of that continent, and the Europeans, the, 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 these Europeans already vaccinating our people, ready to exterminate our people. When these people come, when you will uh, um okay so i'm gonna end here i think um so okay so um let me take a break i'm tired i'm sweating so i'm gonna end this lecture here um please go to the youtube channel um subscribe to the youtube channel share and invite africans to come and learn and come and learn the organic african paradigm Come and learn what we need to do for us to be unified. Come and learn how we can we can stop these things from happening before it's too late. So um, thank you all for coming to this lecture. Um, I hope many of you will watch this lecture. I hope many Africans will watch it. I hope because if this lecture gets only a uh, hundred views or two hundred views, it will be a it will be a, a sad thing because this lecture will teach the African people so much that they need to know. And they, they're running away from it. But then one day they're going to say, oh, the Chinese are dead. We hate the Chinese. Don't hate the Chinese. Just be your own self. They have Sinocentrism. You just need Afrocentrism. That's all you need, Afrocentrism. And how do you get Afrocentrism? The teachings of the organic African paradigm can give you Afrocentrism. You know, that's how we unify Africa. We need our own common ancestor. We need our own common ancestors that all of us can follow our bloodline to that ancestor. We need our common heroes. And everybody say, oh, who are our heroes? Nkrumah, Marcus Garvey. No, we need heroes that go all the way back to Egypt. Kemet. You know, the thing about it is everybody's like, oh, Kwame Nkrumah, Marcus Garvey. Not that these people are not heroes. These people are heroes. But you need ancient heroes. You need heroes that you need to make your heroes into super beings. These people coming up with stuff saying the, the, the yellow emperor has enrolled a dragon into heaven. How many of you Africans are talking about your ancestors rolled a dragon into heaven? How many of you ancestors are saying even your ancestor rolled an elephant into heaven? None of you do that. You don't, you don't make your story. You don't, make, you don't design your history or your ancestors to look cool. You don't do that. You don't design, you are ashamed of Egypt. You're ashamed of Kemet. You're ashamed of Imhotep. You're ashamed to claim Heru. You're ashamed to claim Asar. You're, claim, you're ashamed to claim Asad. You're ashamed to claim Akhenaten. These are your ancestors. You know, not, not just your Zulu ancestors. You need to, 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 to trace yourself back to Akhenaten. To yourself back to uh, 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 Asar. Heru. I said, all these people, you need to trace yourself back to, what's his name, Joser, and Kufu, Kafri. All these people, you need to trace our story back to them. We need to trace our story to ancient Africa, and we need to make those stories. We need to redesign those stories, make those stories supernatural stories. Our ancestors are supernatural beings. They need to be supernatural when we tell the story. But you go, oh, it's like Africans. We got to be the center of this universe. We got to be the center of this world. I mean, there's no other way around it. The Europeans are the center of their world. The Arabs are the center of their world. 
the Chinese are the center of the world. Why, why, why are you ashamed of being the center of the world? What's your problem? Why do you hate being the center of the world? What makes you so, your brain doesn't want you to be the center of the world? Why? What's wrong with you? So, thank you all for coming. Um, positive energy and creation energy to all of you who came to land. Share this video. Um, go to the YouTube channel. Subscribe. I put a lot of effort into this lecture because I wanted you guys to really understand. I really committed a lot of energy and time into this lecture so that you can benefit from it. You know, And I always think of the African people when I do things like this. I put our people first. Our people are the center of the universe in my eyes. Our people are the center of the universe of this planet in my eyes. I don't put no other people equal to the African people on this planet. No other group are equal to the African people. No other ancestor is equal to the African ancestor. If you don't have an African name, you're not an African ancestor as far as I'm concerned. You need an African name. If I don't see your, your, your you know, if you have a foreign name, you're not an African ancestor as far as I'm concerned. You need an African name. You need to have some form of African name. We need to start, Africans, you need to start doing these things, looking back at your people, redoing your story. Remember, the Chinese come from the Dogon and the Khoisan people. The Chinese are the descendants of the Dogon and the Khoisan. They inherited African culture, but they turn around and they turn against their motherland. The land which gave birth to them, they turn against it. The Europeans turn against Africa. The Arabs turn against Africa. So, you as an African, you want to turn against your own Africa, your own, the, the, what is wrong with you? So think about it, you know, think about it, okay? The one who comes in peace is always welcome. The one who comes to teach is always welcome. The one who comes to learn is especially always welcome. Positive energy and creation energy to all of you. And I'll put the lecture on the YouTube channel for all of you. And I will also have it in the audio format. Bye.